This is the Grounded Podcast, episode two, with Dean Lister and me, Jocko Willink. Dean List. Jocko. <laughs> uh, okay, a couple questions to talk about today, and this is something I think will help people not just necessarily in the kind f- confines of the subject matter that we normally talk about, which is the jujitsu slash fight world, but also just in everything. So people are going into a stressful environment, i.e. a competition, a fight, a match, something like that, and different people, well, like, okay, so people get nervous, people get the butterflies, Yeah. and how do you handle that? And I know you have coached and trained all kinds of, you know, the best in the world, world champions. What have you seen from your experience on how to handle those things? Nerves, is that the, is that the proper word? Nerves? Yeah, nerves. How to handle nerves, how Butterflies. to handle adrenaline, how to handle expectation, right? Mm. Expectation of what's about to happen. Or no, no, I think the word is anticipation, right? The anticipation is, is worse than, than the actual event. Yeah, yeah. So what have you seen? What can you talk about? How can you help us? Well, that's that's one of the most common questions I get asked, for sure. Absolutely. First of all, everyone is definitely different. So it's not like one thing is going to be the secret for everyone. I was um, coaching, uh, I was friends with Mirko Krokop mm-hmm. Filipovic in Croatia. Before fights, he actually will just play poker with all his Croatian <laughs> friends. And just he'll be laughing until it's time to put the gloves on and warm up. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, he's also after a fight went back and played poker longer. He's he just he's just not. That's just how he, he he relaxes. So I've I've caught this. I've caught myself doing this too. Everyone does this before a competition. You start replaying in your mind everything that's going to happen. What if the guy does this? I'll do this, and then I'll do a backflip, and then I'll kick his leg, and I'll. I'll yeah, you just think of these crazy things and your heart starts racing or you start thinking. So you mean that in a negative way? So, yeah, you're, you're getting so instead of visualizing like, because you know how some people say, I visualized the entire fight. I walked in, I did the walkout. I walked down the ramp. I got into the cage. The fight went exactly, I, I'd already won in my mind a thousand times. This is different, what you're talking about. This isn't a visualization of positivity. It's visualization of bad things happening. This is, no. You could, either way, it's, a, it's an uncontrolled form of meditation it's not even meditation it's daydreaming and mm-hmm. um it's almost that feeling when you're in a car and you almost get in an accident and you this shock <laughs> yeah. and, you, and you feel tired afterwards well adrenaline just went c- coursing through your veins and now it just got depleted and now you're tired so if if this is not controlled if this is just reckless meandering thoughts yeah it, it it's not good for your energy and this happens to almost everyone that's why some days you're focused, some days you're not. Uh, Mike Tyson had a great, uh, <laughs> it's on YouTube, he talks about, you know, um, mental games before a fight and talks about, you know, uh, before his fight he's not nervous. He says it's, it's wrong, it's wrong. He said he, he's he's afraid of this man who was, was going to hurt him. His whole, his whole time training. You mean being the, not nervous? Not nervous is wrong. Is that yeah, what you just yeah, said? He's, so you, he's saying you should be nervous. Everyone's going to show their amount of nervousness different. Everyone's going to be a little. There are more and less nervous people. That's true. What I mean is, he admitted it, it's it's uh, he. Those words were wrong. He was nervous before fights, but the closer he got to the ring, the less nervous he was. As soon as he got in the ring, he was a god, and no one could touch him. He goes, "This man wants to hurt me. I'm going to hurt him first. And I'm paraphrasing, of course, but he he, he put it in very good words as far as. You know, he's dreamed of this guy beating him before. He's dreamed of it. He doesn't want that to happen. And he's putting the gloves on. He's, he's piercing the, through the leather with his knuckles, and, and he's, he's walking in uh, the arena. But the closer he gets, the more and more confident he gets. That's, that's a form of controlled visualization, not meditation. Let's say that's controlled, though. He's not meandering, just getting excited for no reason. Also, the more you can beat, the better you'll be able to relax. So there's different ways everyone relaxes. Some people don't even relax at all. When I was young, remember, Jocko used to slap me in the face <laughs> three or four times before my fights. And now recently, I'm like, ah, Jocko, I don't need to get slapped anymore. <laughs> it's just, I'm a little older now. So uh, 
the young, younger people want to amp their energy up. The older people want to calm themselves down. Everyone's just a little bit different. Um, there's no such thing as someone who is exactly the same as someone else. I notice that's one thing I like about wrestling is when I see the kids wrestle, my own kids, like you're going to go and wrestle. They have a limit. I don't know if it's a limit anywhere else, but in California, and I don't know if it was like this when you were a kid, but you can only wrestle five times in a day. Hmm. So if you wrestled five times, you're done for that day. But that means, you know, in a two day tournament, you'll get 10 matches yeah. in two days. And that's, that's awesome. It's the same with jujitsu. You know, if you go out and you compete, you're going to compete a lot. You know, you can compete a lot. You can do five matches in one day. You can do eight matches in one day. What's the most matches you've ever had in one day for, for grappling? Because, bro, you used to go up, do your yeah. weight class, one, whatever, 175, and then you'd compete in absolute. Yeah. You'd have like 10 matches yeah, in yeah. a day. Probably 10 is, a, is probably about the max. I don't think. Now, part of them I can't give you credit for because you would just submit people. Like fast, <laughs> there, were, there were good days, you know. Do you never days. look nervous going into a grappling match that I've seen? Mm. I I don't know. I don't know. Um, you look nervous going into a fight. Yeah, you were so yeah. much more comfortable grappling than you were going into MMA fights. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, and part of it's because the obvious you'd grappled thousands and thousands of matches. I mean, yeah. even before I even met you, you'd have done a high school wrestling career, you'd done Sambo career, and now we were into, you know, our jujitsu career, your yeah. jujitsu career. So you already had, you were never, you look like, when you talk about Krokop playing poker, like that's what you were like. You wouldn't be walking around getting hype or anything like yeah. that. You just walk out on the mat like a damn, like a damn zombie slash robot that was about to start murdering people with no yeah. feelings. <laughs> I remember that, actually, I think this is one of your your favorite stories involving myself, but there was the guy, his last name was Silva. Silva, but that's like saying Smith. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. Has such a common last name. But there's many good fighters with the last name Silva, yeah. apparently. And it was in the finals. I beat three guys. He beat three guys. I mean, he submitted. He was, he was good. Yeah. And he was a very hyper he would slap the mat, look at you, stare you down in the eyes. and Very emotional fighter. Yeah, very emotional Most guy. Grappler. And I was just calm. Yeah. And I remember that, um, you know, when someone is that hyper and they're emotional and they feed off the reaction in your face. That's why Fedor, I think his stare down is pretty mm -hmm. good because if you look at him and stare him down, it doesn't work. And when you see on his face that he doesn't really care what you're doing, yeah. that kind of like makes you feel insecure or something <laughs> yeah i don't know so well that was like when holly Holm fought, fought against Ron, uh, rodney ronda yeah and you remember ronda was all was angry there. and all hype and everything yeah. she was going all crazy during the stare downs during the weigh-ins and holly was just looking at her like whatever and same with uh joanna versus thug rose in their yeah. first matchup and joanna's getting all crazy and thug rose just looking at her just no emotion whatsoever and yeah. then went out and but that see, I don't think so I, I think it would have been different results if on either or both of those occasions the the calm person was not calm back, mm -hmm. then you would have played into the the original game. Yeah. Because that, that feedback would have been received in that we're we're playing that emotional game now. Yeah. But if you don't it, so there we go. That's a different way to play the mental game uh -huh. in this in this, in this situation. So everyone's a little different. Some fighters have that for instance I, I before in May, in May fight, I asked my guys, you know, hey, do you really like looking at dudes in the eyes? Do you really want to do that? And, well, no, no. Okay, fine. Because if that's not their personality, just look right through their chest. Don't play the eye game. Because mm -hmm. if you play it and look away, you lost the game now. Yeah. But if you want to play that game, don't look away now. You know, you play the game, you play the game. Or don't play the game. So everyone is just different. There's no <laughs> such thing as one guy exactly the same as maybe similar. But in terms of relaxing or taking the pressure off, everyone's a little bit different. There's no such thing as the same, in my opinion. So uh, so you got Crow Cop on the one end of the spectrum, and he's like a guy that's cold as ice. And part of the reason is because he'd fought so many times. You know, I talk about you being in grappling matches and being totally mellow. Crow Cop had so many fights as a striker that you think he, for him walking into the cage, He's not really nervous about anything because he's been punched plenty of times and it's not that big of a deal. Uh, on the other under the scale, we have we have one fighter which we know you know him, professional fighter now and has fought in the UFC, great friend of ours, 
his first fight, he actually said, he started crying and said, I don't want to be here. <laughs> and I said, calm down, calm down. He goes, no, I, I, that guy's too tough. And he was crying. And he's, this, is, this is a big man <laughs> that uh, crying was just, I'd never seen him cry. And this is like an awkward moment because he's, he's supposed to go out and fight and everyone's sitting around waiting for him. He's, I, I want to leave. And I said, no, you're not going to leave. And basically I had, to, I had to kind of say, no, you're not doing that. You're going to fight. And so he said, okay, oh, my God, I don't know what I'm doing. And he went out there and finished the guy in the first round. So he actually needed a little outside help to relax. <laughs> but he actually won. So the thing is that guy couldn't have played poker mm. <laughs> that day. At that moment, he would have lost every hand, okay? So – Maybe it's that experience. Probably it is. It's definitely something involved in personality as well, though. Because Crow Cop's a little bit, he's got those serial killer eyes. A little bit, I don't know. He's got that little de- bit of detachment in his yeah, eyes. You can see, yeah, you can see. I know him personally. He's a good friend of mine. But he, he has that detachment in his in His, his eyes. whole crew, see. like I remember watching them play poker. Like everyone is pacing and everyone's doing all whatever their pre-fight nerves are going. And he's sitting with all them big gnarly looking dudes and they're just sitting around the other guys are like smoking and drinking <laughs> yeah, <laughs> whatever true. and he's playing poker with them he, getting he, ready yeah, to go to battle <laughs> yep like like that he can detach himself yeah and so i mean that's a good way to uh, a word to use uh, emotional versus detachment maybe that they can they could fall in line there somewhere as far as comparison but some fighters are very emotional some fighters find it easier to detach but it's always going to be, as long as we are a human being and we think outside of this room, like, what can happen? And people have asked me, like, how do you know you, you're going to win? I say, well, actually, I never knew I was going to win. That sounds weird. Am I insecure? No, 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 no. It's not like I'm doubting myself. I just don't. I can't read the future. I can't read the future. And one time is before, I think it was before I fought Jordan Radev, who was from Bulgaria, a very good fighter. I fought him in the UFC. And you said something like, you were in the locker room with me. Hey, Dean, what's wrong? You don't look uh, very. Re- you don't look very relaxed. I'm paraphrasing. Mm-hmm. I don't know what you said, and I went, "Well, you know, um, my my opponent. He's a real good kickboxer. He's a really good wrestler, and and I'm. I was thinking he's gonna uh, something like he hit me with a knee in the head when I grab him, and he went." Yeah, you know, well, in Iraq, and I was like, "God damn it!" Like I <laughs> like already. <laughs> And your whole story was, you know, we're going on a mission. We know where we're going, but we don't know what's going to happen. But we're going to this this building to take it down or whatever. We know who we're looking for. We know the route we're going. We're we're pretty sure it's it's the right way to go. But sometimes you get blown up. You get blown up sometimes. And I was like, I felt like kind of like a pansy at the moment <laughs> because I'm just going to fight a guy. <laughs> I'm not going to get killed. But it, it put things in perspective because your point was, you're going out to do the job anyways. It doesn't matter if you get hit with a knee. It doesn't matter. You're doing it anyways. So why, why doubt that? I already know what I'm going to do. So as far as knowing, no one can predict the future. I guess that's another way of saying what you said to me that fight day. Can't predict the future, but we know we're here to fight. We know we're here to walk out. We, we, we know our true self put ourselves in this situation to better ourselves and to get more experience. So take some comfort in that, that thought and just go out and, and just uh, – Live the match. Live your moments. Well, that's a good point. If you if your attitude is, hey, I'm here to learn, and I'm going to try and win, of course, but if I don't win, then cool, I'm going to learn something about myself, and that's fine. That's part of the reality of it. Will you? Do you get nervous before grappling matches? Mm. Nervous? Uh, yeah, it's, it's more excitement. It's... You know, when my uh, one of my fights, my mom and my sister were there, which is like the only time that ever happened. Uh-huh. That this was is a fight that was in King of the Cage. It was against. Um, oh my goodness, oh, I forget who it was. Anyways, yeah, I, I won the fight without getting punched. So it was <laughs> it was a good fight for me to invi- have invi- invited my sister, and my mom. But I was just I, I couldn't get over the fact that they're there. Now my dad watching me get hit is not so bad. Mm-hmm. So that was a just an example of something that I didn't want to replicate for the next fight. So it depends on certain things. Um, if I if I know I've trained hard, I feel less nervous. I don't say nerves is like the right word to say. Um, I feel alive. I feel in the moment. 
uh, talking about what what what, what, what scares the difference between a grappling and a fight like I get for a fight because I've seen you you are more nervous for a fight and you know why you're more nervous for a fight because there's a higher percentage of chance right there's a chance I mean in my opinion there's a in a, in a fight in an MMA fight there's a more chance plays into it there's, a, there's a many more uncontrolled factors. More uncontrolled factors. I mean, you could get you, you could get caught with a punch and boom, you're done. Right. Yeah, that that yeah. could happen. There's a whatever percentage you want to call that. There's a 12 percent chance of that happening. A seven percent, whatever percent you want to call it, that is zero percent in a in a grappling match. It's zero percent that you're going to get caught with a punch and knocked out. That's not going to happen in a grappling match. Yeah. You you're not going to get caught with a knee. You're not going to get you're not going to get caught with a, a a headbutt and get well I guess you could get caught with a headbutt and get cut. So anyways, there's just a higher percentage of chance. There's also there's also uh, some fine f- finality to um, getting knocked out, right? Yeah. If you get caught in a submission, like you have t- there's it's not fine it's not over until you tap out and for you that must be pretty good because you are very good at escaping submission, we'll call them submission attempts. I mean, you've been, you have had jean Jay Hibero, arguably one of the greatest, you know, world champions ever. He had you in a freaking arm lock and you got out of it. I mean, you've been in, you've been in Uma Plata's, you've been in heel hooks, you've been in chokes, you've been in, you've been in, in paid upon who, at the time was just undefeated beast. No one was even freaking scoring on him. Just a giant, you were in his arm triangle for for five minutes, five minutes right? Yeah. And so, so it's like you have a power to get out. So I'm just saying maybe that's why your nerves for grappling were so calm because you didn't even feel a threat. I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I actually, I don't know why I do this or maybe why I have the ability to do this. But when I feel like I'm supposed to be hurt uh, or damaged or I am injured or something, I, I feel like I get – it simplifies things in my mind for some reason. So uh, also a great fighter named Kakareko had me in an arm guillotine for – and he had the best guillotine in the world. just ranked as the best guillotine in the world. Mm-hmm. And he had me for 30 seconds there. And I was in it, and I could hear the crowd scream, like, ah, and they got, got – Silent because he's choking me, and I, my ear I can't even hear. My ear it started muffling now. He's choking me, but I thought about it like, Wait, choking you, you mean you were starting <clears throat> to lose consciousness, or just uh, the squeeze of the arm was blocking the out the, the sound? The arm was blocking Got out it. the sound because you had an elbow in. Would you have yeah, it? Yeah, well, I blocked his hip with my elbow. Got That's it. why I didn't get under my armpit. That helped me a lot, but it was still, I think oh, most would have tapped to it. Still sucks. Yeah, and I remember being in it thinking, oh, I remember before the match. Saying, saying to myself, oh, you know, Aideen, be careful about his leg locks. Aideen, be careful of his guillotine. I was like, yeah. Wait, you said be careful no, about no, no. his Pe- leg people, locks? No, people told me that. They said oh, he has okay. the best leg locks in Brazil. Like, who knows if he did, but he had, he's ranked as the most feared, feared guillotine in the world at that time. And so I was thinking, yeah, be careful. Of, and then I thought, wait a second, why be careful of it? Like, why not just, why not escape it? You know, I'm not <laughs> saying I, wa- I didn't let him put it on me. But as soon as I see that he was going for this, I was like, we're kind of like, we're committed. It's going to happen. I, I want to see if I can escape this. And that's a different a different way of, I'm not nervous now. I'm excited to want to escape uh, something. You so, played a little mind game on yeah, yourself. Yeah. Um, Consciously or so unconsciously, did you play that mind game on yourself? Looking back on it, it's clear that that relaxed you. Yeah, it did. Remember remember when um, I faced uh, Jamal Patterson from New York and my, my knee was hurt really yeah, bad? Yeah, yeah. And people were going, oh, your knee, because it was a hematoma. You saw it. It my looked knee, bad, My yeah. knee swelled up like it was bad. So I put two, two knee pads on it. And I was thinking like, okay, don't don't put your knee on the ground. But I was like, you know, screw, forget about it. it, it just just take them. It made it so simple. In my, I don't know why. It made things so simple. I'm not saying it was easier. It made things so simple in my mind. And then he went for my knee. Yeah, he attacked your knee. And, and I was, it was kind of like it woke me up. It woke me up like... Like, you know, come on, you could escape this. And, and then I've, that woke me up for some reason. I don't know why. It doesn't make sense to me completely. So it's probably subconscious, you know? Hmm. And then what about over time? So when you were, when when we were 19, when you were 19 and we first started training, and then compared to, you know, when you were 30, 20 years later, when you're 39, 
or 17 years later. Did your did your nerves calm down over time? Were they worse? Were they worse at a time when I don't remember? I wasn't with you at your first ADCC in Brazil. Were you nervous for any of those matches? Mm. Were you nervous it, for the first? Because you lost. Yeah, yeah. The first day in your weight class, you lost. Were you nervous for those matches? Then you I, didn't. I think, you weren't nervous anymore when you went to the I absolute. Think, I think I, I put it in good words right now in my head. I've done better feeling when I didn't have. The pressure. Like, yeah, I didn't have much to lose. Mm-hmm. So, so I'm just. Now people knew who I was. It wasn't. I wasn't unknown, but I was not supposed to even be in the absolute division. It's like, hey, it's, screw it. I, I was thinking to myself, why not just go out there and just, just be a, a nuisance to my opponents. Just be a nuisance. <laughs> be a pain in the ass. Just, just why, Lister? Come on, man. Like, oh god, you know, just be a pain in the ass to everyone, and then have fun doing it, and and actually. Uh, motivate myself and so every time I was in trouble I was like what if I escape this is that that simple it wasn't I need to win or oh, I'm in trouble it's like wouldn't it be cool that's that's what it was wouldn't it be cool if I escape this wouldn't that be pretty cool that's what I said to myself because I was in these chokes and I, I thought to myself wouldn't it be cool and yes it was cool when I escaped them <laughs> so you know and then when at the finals at Kakareko I mean that move no one was doing 50 50. No. And I did it. And you can see on my opponent's eyes, he, he doesn't know what's Confusion. going on. Confusion. And I got him. And so imagine, I did not, I'm not the first person in history to use that position. There's no way of thousands of years people have done it before. I've even seen a picture of an Umu Plata that's like 2,000 years old. I've seen a standing Umu Plata. So these are, these are old things. Of course, someone has done it. But no one taught that to me, and it worked, and I won Abu Dhabi. So when I got relaxed to where I could try things out and actually have fun, it was incredible. Is that like when you watch a, like a basketball game? And I think basketball is a good example because the scoring is so rapid. But if someone gets, goes up by four, five, six, seven points, all of a sudden they take a little bit more risk, they're a little bit more confident, they have less pressure, and then they go all of a sudden they go from being up four points to being up nine, like, 19 points in a very short period of time because the or soccer is another good one even though it's the opposite end of the spectrum once a team gets you know two to zero they're gonna win and so now they can like take more chances and they put even more pressure on the goal so that's similar to what you're saying on yourself you put less pressure on yourself or there actually is less pressure like in in your first in 2003 you already you lost your weight division. Okay, yeah. so okay, you're you're out. You're you're a, you're a loser. Whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. then all of a sudden, okay, you're gonna go in there. Hey, doesn't really matter. You've you've already competed in your weight division. Just gonna go out, have fun, do your best. And then when you do that, when you kind of, and I don't want to say this too, crazy. When you throw caution to the wind and you start taking chances and you start letting your game just go, that is a very positive thing. You know. And then it was they, they actually interviewed Josh Barnett after I lost to him. I said, um, is it true that Lister hasn't been submitted in 17 years? And he said, yeah, it's true. Last time Lister was submitted was during the Clinton administration. I said, That's, <laughs> that was kind of funny you said it like that. But here's what happened. Uh, there's other factors as well, as, as, of, of course, as well as uh, Barnett being an incredible athlete. But I remember now looking back, that day, the day before, the day before, Hey, you know, you haven't been submitted in 17 years. Oh, yeah. That was the main thing. That was on my mind. I had something to lose mm-hmm. subconsciously. So I was cautious to keep that. Subcon- I realized yeah. now, oh, you know, I can't be. Instead of going, hey, screw it, I'm going to. And, and, and you know what you said about the team in basketball that gets up and awesome, but also check it out. You get the team that gets up by 20 points in football, and the coach goes, hey, don't blow it. We're up by 20 points. Don't yeah, screw up. Yeah. And the other team's like, hey, let's win 40 to 20 now, right? So yeah. it depends on if, the, if the, <laughs> That's the, the opposite mentality. The people that are yeah. down by 20, they start taking huge chances. They got nothing to lose. They might as well go for it. And boom, they are the ones that turn exactly. it over. Yeah, that, the Barnett thing, and like you said, he's, he's an unbelievable competitor. But I don't think you should have done that competition. And I'm the one that trains with you, but you – had injuries going into it like that's the worst bro i was beating you up going into that competition and i should have not let you i mean we we were only we couldn't train very often because you were injured when we were training i was beating up which i cannot normally do and i should have just been like hey don't do this 
because you're not ready. You know, that's one of those things I I I should have never looking back on it, that's just not it's not a good way to go, you know. Yeah, but but you know, it has happened where I I'm not doing well and then I, all the good competition. No, there's a difference. Before. I think there's a difference between what we're talking about. I'm you're talking about you've trained and then you get sick at the last minute or the day of or you have an injury the day of but you're trained and you're prepared and you can overcome that. You were in a situation on that one where you weren't you weren't able to train to prepare for it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. so, look, man, I've trained you for so many different things and sometimes I might have a good time beating you up a little bit yeah. at the at the 12 week mark when That's you, true. you know yeah. of the 12 week mark of a training camp where you're just starting out by the end of it in the good when you're ready i can't i what i need is to bring three more other guys three other guys in with yeah. me i need to bring three other guys in with me so that i can call so i can do a tag team after 4 minutes when you're like abusing me like I'm a freaking child and I can tag someone out and they can come in fresh and get you. That's the way it's supposed to be. And that camp, it wasn't like that. And as a matter of fact, now that I think about this whole story, it was a 20 minute match. Yeah. And I had done a couple days where I put fresh guys on you. Like I did like a tag team thing and you just got beat down because you, you just, you know, you were injured, you were sick, you were hurt and you hadn't been training. And so you got a beat down. And then three days later, it was like a Saturday, and you said, let's just go you and me 20 minutes. And I said, in my mind, I was like, damn it, he's gonna beat me up. And then you didn't beat me up. Oh, you, you and, and I realized, I was like, this has never happened. That actually had never happened before. And so that's when I knew, you know what? I, that's when I should have said, Dean, this is not the right time. You you should wait, you should recover, you should train hard for six months and do a match then. So. I take that one as definitely my fault. No, um, not at all. And and no. and I also blame Josh Barnett for being awesome. <laughs> you know, yeah. no, no, he's a beast. You know, totally. And I blame Josh. Barnett. And you know what's cool too, man? Uh, the stuff that Josh did symbolically to tie back to his roots, to yeah. to the to the Japanese wrestling, and I thought that was cool too. So props to Josh. You, but uh, you, you know what? In that match, well, okay, I'm, I'm trying to put this in good words. In my life, when I've done well. I've I've won and lost because well primarily usually I've won but off of different reasons I've won matches by being tougher I've won matches on being um, innovative I won matches off of uh, being strong and whatever I, these are all different qualities you need to have uh, at, at the higher level but the idea of making your opponent endure your your energy versus you enduring the opponent's energy or force. Mm -hmm. that, that's that's when I've done really well is when so this match I I accepted Barnett's weight and his his aggressive movement and I just endured it I wasn't I wasn't responsive to it in time mm -hmm. and when I've done well is when I'm making my opponent react to me oh so, yeah so that's that's the willingness to engage the enemy yeah maybe, you know what I'm saying yeah no I mean and of course you know if anyone thinks I'm sitting here saying Josh isn't like an unbelievably unbelievable beast of an athlete and like I love the fact that he's you know, a submission-based, um, you know, catch wrestling guy. He's just awesome. So, yeah, but from seeing the whole thing from my perspective, it was a bummer. Then I and I should have, as a training partner, as a coach, I should have said, "Hey, man, don't do this." And one thing that's very hard for for me to do with you is get you to pull out of a match. Yeah. You know, because I would say I was thinking that maybe three weeks out, I started saying you know what, we're not gonna get there. And I should have said, hey man, d just stop. Like, let's reschedule this thing. And there's, I think in my mind, I thought there's no way you're gonna pull out of a match three weeks away. You're not gonna be disrespectful yeah. to a legendary guy like Josh Barnett and not, you know, do the competition. So maybe that was a little bit of a of a lost cause. Well, well talking about being nervous before a match, there are certain times when it's not the time for you to compete, but that's that's the rare, situation uh what is more common is someone making an excuse uh not to compete because of this or this or this and interesting enough is to think like okay i need to i need to get in shape to compete okay that makes sense but but if that's always your excuse 
I mean, at some point, you just got to compete to get it to get it going. You know, I've, I've heard people say, "I need I need to I need to get in shape to learn jiu-jitsu. Yeah, that's, that's almost like answer. someone saying, "I need to learn French before I go to French class." I mean, just you got to go in and learn the movements, and, and you get you get in shape by doing the sport. You know? yeah. So competing is similar. I mean, there's always an excuse. I mean. It happens all the time. There's always a reason not to compete. But the more you don't compete, the more you find these these mind games that, that mess up your your rhythm. The, the longer you have where your your style is um, is not benefited from your competition. Yeah, yeah. So that was good. You know, another thing you were saying about Mike Tyson, and I think this is an important p- part to think about. And I, last last podcast, I was talking about how much humility you have in the fact that your mind is open and I believe that the reason that your mind is open is because you're a humble person and you look at other people and you think, oh, that maybe that person could do that better than me. And when you said about Mike Tyson, Mike Tyson would think that the person he was gonna fight was gonna kill him. And yeah. therefore, that what's that gonna do? It's gonna make you train freaking hard. So that's another good reason to, to stay humble because as you, as you train, and there's you know I there's a there's a little dichotomy, <laughs> which is if you okay you you have to have a coach right that's going to push you, but the coach can only push you to ninety six percent. The only person that can push you to one hundred percent is you. Yeah. Like you can always hold back a little bit. Hey, I can make you do more freaking jump squats, but that's not the same as you going a hundred percent on the jump squats. You can add more repetitions, but it's not the same. So that's another part I think that is important when it comes to humility is, you know, you respect your opponent. And and that's one thing I can say about like Josh Barnett. You knew that here's a guy that's strong. He's a grappler. He's a wrestler. You knew that that was going to be game on. Yeah. And, you know, like I said, you were training hard, but we couldn't train like we normally would. And that's my fault no no well, you know you know it's it's like it's something i figured out that took me a long time to figure this out like how hard you train versus training to get in the zone and if you're not getting in the zone it doesn't matter how hard you train because nothing's working out for you so if you're not it, if you just super if you train hard 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 it's better than it's better than no training it's absolutely better than no training but if you can figure out a way to get in your zone and make things work for yourself that'll be better for you you know so getting the zone is, I think that's a, a good thing to aim for. Do you know? think that, do you, don't you think though, when you train, that opens up the zone for you? It opens up you. The opportunity to get in the zone? Yeah, there we go, there we go. I find that the more I train, the bigger opportunity I have of getting into the zone. But if you do, and I think you'll agree with this for sure, if you train too much, you start to close the opportunity to get in the zone. Yeah, it, you can you can definitely overtrain, and you can get to a point where it's not being beneficial to you. And I definitely have done that to you over the years, especially in the early years. You know, we I train you so hard, I could see you f- start to go down, and then we'd you know I'd, we'd take time off or give you a few days off, you know, so you could like recover. Yeah. Jock would actually say, "Hey, Dean, I think you need a day off." <laughs> If Jacques says that to you, yes, there's a real need, reason. <laughs> you do need a day off. If I tell you you need a day off, you definitely need hey, a Dean, day off. Hey, uh, Dean, we're not doing a second workout today. Just, you know, oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Why? Yeah. No, just, just uh, go and watch a movie. Have, have a good day. Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> Eat some steak, dude. Yeah. Eat some steak. steak. What do you think the different types of things that cause the anxiety to be present? That's, right. a, that's a, there we go. See, now we're looking at. Okay, what is what's the reason? What's the root cause? Yeah, what's the root cause? Well, let's say okay. everyone's different. There's a lot of overlap here. I mean, are you afraid of damage, getting hurt? I'm just like, that's normal. Are you afraid of being humiliated? Are you afraid of maybe realizing you're not as strong as you thought you were? Are you nervous that? By the way, I'm saying that as realistic. I'm mm-hmm. not. I'm not talking oh, smack. Oh, for I sure. Mean, really, for sure. Is that a fear? Is that a, the fear of weakness? Is it, are you embarrassed you'll look silly in front of other people? Are you worried about an opponent dominating you and feeling helpless? Are you worried you're gonna be tired and out of shape and feel and feel like you're, you're, you have not been training hard? Are you worried the truth will be exposed? Well, that's the, I think that's the one of the root causes, the truth. The truth oh. is ugly. The truth is ugly. The truth is ugly. The truth. The truth is ugly. Especially if you are presenting 
a different facade that doesn't represent the actual truth. So if you're walking around acting like a tough guy and you're afraid that you, in deep and deep in your heart, you think that maybe you're not as tough as you think you are and you're afraid that that truth is going to be exposed, that's definitely gonna be a problem. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's a problem. It's a problem, yes. That can be a problem. <laughs> so what is it? What is it? Usually it's being humiliated in front of people and feeling weak and dominated. That's, that's it's, okay. The physical aspect, that's, that's, of course, that's there, but it's usually the idea of being embarrassed and feeling weak. That's usually, that's a universal fear, uh, fear I think. You know, matter of fact, the absolute horror of being so fatigued you can't move, that, that's a terrible feeling. And I know, I know how it is. You could, um, oh, no, you can always push. Yeah, you can always think you can, but there's a moment where, you know, I can do 11 squats. I can't do 12. What can I do? Okay, what about 13? Well, okay, what about four? I mean, at some point, mm -hmm. your body, oh, but what about that? What Does that mean I cannot train hard to where I cannot get 15 the next day? No, of course I can do that. So at the time, physiological the time, breakdown, you cannot go anymore. At that time, that guy had my arm there. I couldn't move and I had to tap. And that's the truth. Well, if you can't admit that, that, that's a hard pill to, to swallow. That's, that's a real difficult thing to admit. Um, you know, ego, the, the ability to, let's say, the, the inability to admit I'm not as strong as I thought I was, that, that's a scary thing for a lot of people. A lot of, and I think nowadays where everything's YouTube, Facebook, me, 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 right? I mean, to actually look at me, right, at my own... My own style, I'll admit I'm doing something wrong, I'm making a mistake, or I'm not as strong as I thought I was. That's a fear a lot of people have. And it's an ugly, it's an ugly truth to face. But if you can face that, I mean, wouldn't that be almost like, a, almost like extreme ownership of yourself? For sure. If you can actually do that. I mean, I think that would be overall a good investment you can give yourself. If you can give it. So what actually scares you? That's what it is. That's what so it is. now here's where the dichotomy Economy. comes in okay. because check it out you want to have that attitude but at the same time you know i know fighters and you see fighters that have this overwhelming confidence and they might not even be as skilled as their confidence belies but the confidence actually works right like they have so much belief in themselves that they can 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 project that on their opponent and they sometimes beat their opponent before they've even stepped into the cage mm -hmm. Yeah, I've so there's a, there's a balance, yeah. right? I mean, uh, on paper, Conor McGregor versus Jose Aldo. On paper, who should have won that fight? Well, Aldo had more of a history. More of a history. Yeah. I mean, more m more um, actual bouts, more victories. I mean, he was just. I don't know if that. I think that I would describe that more as spirit. And I'm not going to say you have to believe in the spirit. I mean, the <laughs> the attitude, the the self. Yeah, it is self belief. Uh, man, it's a it's a weird thing. I do know people who have that that outward facade of power that when they do lose, they're gone. Mm -hmm. So I think it still does apply if you can accept the ugly truth. And the ugly truth could be I just made a mistake. I went left. I should have gone right. It has happened. It has happened before. I I even saw when Krokop fought Fedor, there was a kick Krokop throw through, and as a fighter, I know Fedor didn't see it. But he put his head down and threw overhand right at the same time, and I could be wrong, but as a fighter, his head went down the same time the leg went up, and the leg missed him by two inches. Mm -hmm. If Fedor didn't throw that punch, it would be KO, in my mm -hmm. opinion. Mm -hmm. he, he wouldn't have got it. So what happened was the, the kick missed, and I believe Krokop fell down, or Fedor took him down. So it was just well-timed. Of course, the harder you train, the, the, the better, better your the, timing is. <laughs> <laughs> the luckier you get, yes. So. So sometimes the, the, the truth is that you should have gone left and you went right. But when you do make a mistake or something bad happens to you, okay, how are you gonna come back from that? And I'm, I'm not trying to sound like the kindergarten school teacher, like, oh, you never know, it just it's, it only matters. You can never make a mistake, just, just come back stronger than ever. I'm not trying to sound like that. But, <laughs> but how do you come back from a mistake? You know, not, I'm trying not to be Mr. Positive with what I'm saying. Well, you've done that multiple times. 
you know, obviously the, the your first world championship in Brazil uh, in Brazil in 2003, you came back from being how many matches did you have your first day? Two. I lost my second match. Who'd you lose it to? Jean G. Barrow. Jean G. Yeah. My nemesis. And he beat you on we points. Were, we were tied, and then he won. He won eight, eight to four, or did he win by eight? No, five points. I mean, he might have. I knew he eight. like ran up the score because you oh, had to take some risks at the I end. I think it was tied four to four. I think he won twelve to four or something. Yeah, yeah. he was. Just, yeah, and there's a turning point in the match. This is actually relevant to to what you learn and how you you handle things and make them into a positive. There's a move called a sit through, or also known as a peek out, where you have the opponent's legs and you you, you have to throw yourself under them and get around to their back. And I've done that move pretty well. And I learned at age 14 in wrestling, it's a wrestling move, how you do not ever look to the head. When I go under, I circle around to your back and I look to your feet. No matter what happens, do not look the other way. I know this is at age 14. And with Janji, I'm doing the move to him, I'm walking around and I took the wrong way and that moment of weakness, I looked back and Janji just was on top and that was the turning point of the match. Wait, so when you looked, you so you got like curious and you looked at his head, what? It's because it seems like the easier way to go. It feels, uh, it feels like if I go that way, I might get on top. It just feels that way, but it never happens. <laughs> it never happens. I'm going, I should just kept walking around and I'm not, I don't know what happened. But the next day, lo and behold, I faced a very good uh, opponent, Marcio Cruz Pejipano Pe mm -hmm. from Brazil. Very tough guy. And he's taller, longer, and heavier than Janji. And at that moment, I believe he was higher ranked than Janji. Janji was already ranked as a world champion. Yeah. Well, he and, was definitely higher ranked in that weight class because yeah. he, he was way bigger. What did he yeah. weigh, 265? Something like that. He's a huge guy. Yeah, he's a freaking monster. He, he looks like... Um, my goodness, <laughs> he looks like a mutant. Yeah, Pedapano is just like I believe it's it's the it's the moose from Rocky and Bull. I don't know. Yeah, he, it's he, some he's cartoon. Named, character. He's named a cartoon character. He just looks like a big cartoon. And I did this move to him, and I had to walk more than three sixty, but I did not look back to head. And then I got to him, and that was the turning point of that match, and I won. Uh, so if it wasn't for that mistake, literally, I don't know if I would have even you know. I'm not saying, no, but I maybe not have even won the absolute division. So that mistake actually probably is the reason I won the next day, actually. And also, I didn't have anything to lose. Yeah. I wasn't the North American qualifier trying to come out and, I mean, I was, I was not supposed to win, so I had nothing to lose. And um, that was a good thing for me to have that day. Were you ever able to capture the attitude of nothing to lose in a situation like 2011, when you won again, you, do you think you captured that? Did you have nothing to lose because here was the old man coming in to fight against the young kids, there's no way this guy's gonna win. Was that enough to kind of get your mindset right? I think I did. I didn't realize it until afterwards though, because. Because in Spain, I went to Spain with you. Yeah. I'm also bad luck, <laughs> I'm bad luck. No. <laughs> it seems like when I've gone to Abu Dhabi World Championships with you, you have not won. When I'm not with you, you win. <laughs> so bad luck. But so when we went to Spain, it seemed like there was hype, right? There was like yeah. you were Dean Lister, you were the. Oh, I came back from bicep surgery. Yeah. So, so it's like, hey, you uh, had a bicep surgery, but you're back. Yeah. And there was like a lot of expectations around you. 2005, I was the super fight champion versus the very respected Jean Jacques Machado. And 2007, my bicep snapped. I can't face Roger Gracie. So I was potentially going to be the next defending super fight or champ, but I'm out because of injury. So 2009, I come back uh, as the previous, yeah. the guy who couldn't 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 f compete. Face Roger. So he's still the man. Yeah, that's what it was. So there was a lot of pressure, and I remember it felt that way. It felt yeah. that way, like when we were in Barcelona, right? Barcelona. When we were in Barcelona. You know, you were like Dean Lister, and and everyone there was a lot of pressure. Like, hey, it's Dean Lister; he's back. He's gonna he's gonna crush everyone. And I mean, you did fine, but you lost a freaking crappy match by by refs' decision or something. Yeah, it was it was a it very was such a close, close match, very that, close match. That, too clo too it close. Could have gone either way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but anyways, there was. But then you somehow you were able to go to England, 
the next and, one, 2011. And get yeah. the mindset of, so now it's two years later, you hadn't, you didn't do good in the previous 80s. Maybe that's what it is. All it took was you, you didn't do good in the previous one, so now you show up, there's no expectations again. Oh, it's Dean, he's he's too old now. He didn't even do good last time. Don't worry about Dean. And you're over there going, cool, don't worry about me. I'll be, just be over here getting after it. Just gonna let loose. And it worked. Yeah, I and think you called, you were injured too, ribs, right? Well, that was I didn't want anyone to know, know about that. It was my second match against. Um, See, this is another thing I noticed about you. Like I talked to you, and you, I could tell I was actually happy you had injured ribs <laughs> because you were like, I got injured ribs. It's another one of those things where. I could tell it was getting your mind into the mode of you have yeah. nothing to lose. Like, hey, I have injured ribs, and you were kind of like, I have injured ribs, but I'm just gonna go. You said, I'm not gonna do the absolute, but I'm just gonna do, I'm just gonna finish my weight class. You know? <laughs> and I was kind of thinking to myself, okay, he's in that zone of he has nothing to lose, which is the perfect zone for you to be in. Well, I told myself, and I'm not, I'm not uh, the big praying type, but I was like, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pray. And I said, God, um, you know, if, if you can help me just get through this moment, and if I can win my division, I promise I won't do the absolute division. But if I don't win, I'm gonna go the absolute division. I'm gonna hurt myself really bad, just so you know. <laughs> if you the, want me to hurt myself, <laughs> that's the uh, that's probably one of the most awkward uh, prayers yeah. that God has ever heard. Yeah, he probably he probably was like, he was probably like bro, is that all you got for real? Well, you're, then I won. And, well, and I, you're supposed to say, hey, if I can win, I'll dedicate the rest of my life to uh, helping underprivileged children. Yeah, yeah. Not if I win, I won't do the absolute. I think he didn't want me to hurt myself. <laughs> I think it worked. A, uh, when people procrastinate for uh, um, for the pain or for the, not, not the pain, but the but the nerves that they're about to have. Is there any way to overcome, like you gotta face, does it help to face those nerves? Is there a way to face the nerves earlier? I, I, have, a, I have a new, have you thought of this word? The procrastination of procrastination. Like I, I've actually caught myself, even listening to your words, going, hey, get up right now and, and I'm, I'm like, yeah, for later. I go, wait a second, I just procrastinated. The pro <laughs> <laughs> I just did, I just did exactly what, I shouldn't do. Yeah. So if you actually can catch yourself realizing when you're procrastinating, that's a big thing because sometimes it just flies right by you. Yeah, we're in and human, be human beings are really good at at camouflaging yeah. or ignoring or covering up for procrast or procrastination by not even acknowledging that it's there. So is the question just how to prepare for the no, competition see, or does, how to does procrastination? I guess my point is that procrastinating the event coming does not help you avoid getting nervous. Well, it, it's it's something I mentioned earlier about the true, your true self has has one of you to, to compete. The day of your competition, you might be thinking, what was I damn thinking? This is, un this is uncomfortable, These all these emotions, what am I thinking, your self-doubt, and the more you compete, it'll get better and better and better. Even if you don't win your first tournament, even if you lose your first match, you will become better over time, as long as you don't give up. But Oh man, I, I guess the point is that if you if you get in the habit of procrastinating what you're supposed to be doing, you're going to be more nervous. Yep. You're going to have more yeah so more anxiety so, so going you're, into you're, the situation. Your original self needs to actually commit and set a date and say, "I'm doing that day." That's it. And actually, make sure it's not a date where you have an excuse like, "Oh, it's my uh, my my in laws wedding anniversary, <laughs> whatever." You have no damn <laughs> excuse to get out of it. Just find a day where you can commit and do it. And then start training, and if you feel that you're procrastinating, you actually I now have a date, and that's a lot harder to procrastinate now that you have a date. Yeah, it's possible. It's harder. You know what? Speaking of looking to the future, so Sarge, <clears throat> Sarge used to say when he was getting ready, like to for wrestling, he would he, I would say, well, who you know, he would be talking to me about visualization, and I'd say, who would you visualize that you're going against? And he he'd always say, I visualize a blank face. And I would just kill this blank face. He goes, and then, like, when he actually knows who he's going to wrestle, you know, because, you know, he's going to wrestle such and such a school and they're supposed to have this guy, but he said, I wouldn't picture that guy's face. That way, if it changed, yeah. I wouldn't be, like, caught off guard. So, you know, if he's wrestling at 143 or whatever, and there's someone else, you know, so he knows the guy from this school is 143. They know he knows who the guy is. He knows what he looks like, but he doesn't picture that guy. Yeah. He pictures a wrestler with a blank face, just a white blank 
face. And then, and then as like the day arrives and he sees that that guy's made weight and he's not injured and that's who he's going to wrestle, then, then, he, he, then, puts, he, then he, he puts he that assigns, face on there and goes out and murders him. He probably <laughs> says, I assign a face to him. <laughs> did, did he tell you like this looking you sideways? <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine him talking like that too. <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, man, those are, those are some good – um, things to talk about. I think I think really the biggest takeaway is like you are going to get nervous for competition. You're going to get ner- nervous for job interview. You're going to get nervous to step up and lead for the first time. You're going to get nervous when you have your first kid. There's all kinds of situations that you're going to get nervous about. Frame it, you know, frame it in your brain. Understand it. Understand that it's not a bad thing, you know, like Mike Tyson Hey, it's okay. I'm going to be nervous. Yeah, you should be nervous because it's a big deal. And if you're not afraid of it, if you take it, you contain it. Don't let it run you. But you use that fear. You use that anxiety. Use those nerves to make you train harder. Maybe that's the part about procrastination. If you procrastinate, if you keep saying, well, I won't be nervous, right? Yeah. Like if you procrastinate feeling those, if you procrastinate facing those, you can get used to them. Like here we are. We're ready. Yeah. You know, you know, even when we're training for a fight and it's like we start training in the beginning of the camp, you know, it doesn't really matter what time of day you train. You're training a few times a day, but then the closer you get to camp, the more you want the, to train around the time you're actually going to fight. Yeah. You don't want to procrastinate those because now, now you start thinking, okay, it's real easy to say, oh, I'm fighting in six weeks. I'm feeling a little bit nervous. I think this is what I was talking about with the procrastination thing. I'm feeling a bit, little bit nervous. I'm just going to bury those thoughts right now. Yeah. You know what I mean? You procrastinate facing the nerves. So I guess what I'm saying is don't procrastinate facing the nerves. Like, ex- be like, oh yeah, think about it yeah. and think about what you're gonna do with those nerves. Don't procrastinate being nervous because the nerves will grow and they m- you won't know how to handle them. What do you think about Musashi saying he would envision every possible way of death, falling off a cliff, being incinerated by a fire and mm-hmm. just going off on this giant list about now he's ready for the worst of the worst and nothing can really scare him. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's you know, going on the battlefield already dead is a very positive thing. And, you know, we had this guy, the Frenchman, Doug Letourneau on the podcast and he was in SOG in Vietnam and they were doing just the most insane missions you can possibly imagine. And it's not on the podcast. I talked about it on the podcast because we conversed after he left or after we stopped recording. But for every operation that he went on, before he went, he made his bed, he squared away his foot locker, he put everything in its right place, he removed anything that was you know, questionable or unsat so that his foot locker could be sent home because yeah. every op that he went on, he thought he could die and he wanted to be ready for it. And so if you have that attitude going in, yes, I think that's a I think that's a great attitude to have. I think the worst attitude you can go into these situations is is I'm afraid it's going to happen. I'm not uh, ready for it, yeah, right? Yeah. I'm not ready to make that sacrifice. I'm not If you face the fact, I guess this is another procrastination. If you look at if you if you're 6 weeks away from a fight or you're 6 weeks away from a job interview and you have a quick thought that I'm going to get knocked out or I'm going to say the wrong thing and not get the job, and instead of saying, "Okay, well, what does that mean?" Because if you, if you rationalize and say, hey, I'm going to learn something or I'm going to learn something about the job that I didn't get or I'm going to have more opportunity to prepare. If you say, okay, well, this is the worst case scenario. I get knocked out. Worst case scenario, I don't get the job interview. Cool. Let's deal with it right now. Don't procrastinate. Look at what it actually, how does that affect your life? Because guess what? There's other jobs out there. There's other fights you can do. You're going to get knocked out at some point. Let's figure out what you mistake you made. So if you look at the thing, you don't procrastinate the nerves, you face the nerves, and again, the dichotomies, I'm not talking about sitting around and being nervous for freaking six weeks and having your adrenaline pumping all the time. No, yeah, I'm not talking yeah. about that. So there's, yeah. there's, there's these things you have to do. You have to anticipate the fact that you're going to be nervous and then learn how to deal with these, these thoughts by just thinking through them. And if you think through them, I think, that's the, I think that's the solution. You think through what's the worst case scenario. Worst case scenario is you get tapped out. Hey, Jocko. Yeah. You want to hear a training method to even help you more for a jiu-jitsu for this type of thing? Absolutely. I always have done this, and you are one of the few that never shied away from this. I always start in a bad position. Mm-hmm. I always start in almost the worst position. I always start with, well, I, I, you're aware of this. Start with you, like, not you specifically, but start with an arm lock on me. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to start from there. Because if that's the worst of the worst, 
every day I'm starting there. First of all, I'm eating a harder workout than you. Mm-hmm. I'm cheating. <laughs> I'm I'm selfish actually. Mm-hmm. Now my friend may not see it that way because yeah. it's easy day for him. Yeah. You know, he's not risking his arm, but I'm actually getting stronger. My my bones, my arms are getting super strong because of the resistance I get, you know. And that, I think that's one reason why I can, I can, I'm not saying I can rest in an arm lock, but I can, I can kind of hang out there for a while, you know. I think one day I did five arm locks in you in a row, meaning exactly what you're saying. I started in the arm lock. I started in the arm lock and you got out of all of them. That to me was ridiculous. My arm lock's not great, but it's not no, it's bad. Good. You have good arm lock. <laughs> it's not bad. No, it's and good. I arm lock plenty of people. And you were letting me start in the arm lock. I'm talking in the arm lock. Like my legs are I have your arm. You should be tapping in in less than one second. That's where I was starting. Oh, with the arm extended, you mean? Yeah. Totally oh. extended. Do you not remember this? Yeah, I remember I remember, yeah. And I was on a good I had a good day though. I was on a I don't know. I had, I had a real good day. That well, day. and actually, you what you were doing was you were showing me something, because you did this escape, and I couldn't stop you. And then you said, "Here's what I'm doing." No. Oh. And it was like the whole thing of your shoulder going into the thing, and then you showed me the Jean Jay escape, and I was like, "God, that's the kind of thing that freaks me out about you." Because how did you know that? How do you know that? I think it's because you have a depth of knowledge that's not normal. I don't know. I don't know. Like the fact, it's counterintuitive. The way you escape that arm lock is counterintuitive. No one would think that pushing more into it would be more beneficial, right? Yeah, yeah. But somehow it is. Well, it's like, it's like an, you ever get frustrated untying a knot? And now the knot's just like, bro, you gotta uh, cut it now. Yeah, you, gotta, yeah, yeah. you get frustrated and you're like, oh, damn it. Like, you know, I should have just relaxed pushed into the, you know, right. You get, try to pull it apart and knots yeah, now, it's yeah, just yeah, done. Yeah, yeah. So sometimes if I pull away from a submission, how about I gotta ease into it a little bit? So I didn't push and I eased in. Well, no, okay, my shoulder went up. That's true. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that was a good day for me. I, w- I was just on that day. I remember that day. It was on this this uh, mat, our normal mat we, we train on. Yeah. Um, but if I start, and also as Jinjak Machado, he he has great great back attacks. He has a great choke. Uh, we, half my training started with the, my opponents on my back. Mm-hmm. Half my training started there. To where I can kind of relax in that situation. And if I can start when someone's mounted on top of me and learn how to escape that, I can use that as my rock bottom reset point. Mm-hmm. I can always reset that point. And then that helps me mentally to relax. Because if, if your fear is I'm getting smashed from, uh, from the bottom and I can't breathe, start there. Mm-hmm. Start there and learn how to relax and learn how to escape it. It's not, it's not what you want to happen, it's what you want to avoid happening. So because of that, start in that situation. Put yourself in bad positions. Boxer has a problem getting on the corner, start in the corner in boxing. Every round, you start in the corner. It's gonna suck, mm-hmm. but soon, remember you, you can say we had that fighter, uh, Puerto Rican kid oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. in City Boxing. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he was well-rounded, but his problem, I recall, was being in the corner stuck. Mm-hmm. He was a small guy, but if he, he wasn't in the corner, he, he he'd light you up. But if you, but learning how to fight out of the corner, eventually you couldn't hold him in the corner. I mean, there's things like that, you know. So as uncomfortable as that is, you have to confront it as soon as you can, and that will also help you from procrastinating because you are not procrastinating by confronting your fear directly as a training method. Check. Check. That's a good place to close, man. Awesome. Uh, Dean, if you want to talk to, if you want to hit up Dean Lister on social media, he's on Instagram at Dean Lister BJJ. Right? Yes. And anyone has any kind of questions, you want me to go over this kind of thing, send me a little message at Dean Lister BJJ. Então, meus irmãos do Brasil, me manda um. Pergunta uma sujeita, se você quer falar de uma coisa, me manda um texto, uma mensagem. Obrigado, abraços. I said the same thing in Portuguese. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. I heard you say pergunta. Pe- per- pergunta. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. That's Spanish, bro. Yeah, well, I know. <laughs> they're, they're close, though. And if you want to hear from me, I'm, I'm at Jocko Willink. Doc. I'm at I, I just at Jocko Willink. Yeah, I have another podcast called Jocko Podcast, jockopodcast.com. And our gym here, where Dean and I are at, is victorygyms.com we're here in san diego california if you come out to san diego come by 
get some training in, hang out. And if you need jujitsu gear, go to originmain.com. We got geese that are American made. We got supplements for life. So you can check that out too. Anyways, have a good one and go roll. We'll catch you later. Out. Out. <laughs> <laughs>